Hello and welcome to the Organic Gardening Podcast. I'm Sarah Brown and I'm joined by Chris Collins, my colleague at Garden Organic. May is a time of bird song and lush green growth. It's our most beautiful month. Even when we're in lockdown, we can see out of the window that spring has truly sprung. Lockdown once again has brought its frustrations, and if you simply don't have time to garden, don't worry. Chris and I will help you get by on the basics. And if you can get out, maybe to your allotment or you're mustard keen to get your veg growing at home, then we have tips and advice on how to grow the organic way. Making a compost heap, organic slug pellets, and what's attacking the new growth in the greenhouse are all in our post bag this month. Our interview is a double header. We welcome Charles Dowding, a passionate advocate of the no-dig technique, and Stephanie Hafferty, who wrote the best-selling book with Charles, The No-Dig Organic Home and Garden. This really is a bumper episode, so sit back. You've got an hour of perfect listening and a chance to escape into the world of organic growing. And as always, we're grateful to our sponsor, the Organic Gardening Catalogue. You can shop online with them. They're working hard to keep up with orders, and you can find nearly everything you might need to support your organic growing. And if you're a member of Garden Organic, you get 10% off everything. So just go to www.organiccatalogue.com. So here we go. Once again, Chris and I have had to speak down the line. I'm sure you'll forgive the slightly less than perfect sound. Chris, hi, how are you? Hi, Sarah. Yeah, I'm feeling a bit better. It's been a bit rough for me the last few weeks, but I'm I'm on the mend. I'm feeling good today. You actually had the virus, I gather. Yeah, I did. I did catch it. I suppose I was a bit of a sitting duck in a way, because obviously, I mean, I did two huge talks in Brighton, the Lake District. I must have met a couple of hundred people in the space of a a week, so maybe I am. It was maybe inevitable (laughs) that I picked something up somewhere. I'm sorry. It sounds like you had a really rough time with it. Yeah, well, you know, there's people having a much worse time, so I'm not going to... So, um, I'll be grateful for the fact that I'm back to health, Sarah. Well, it's lovely to hear your voice again and, and, and to be back with us. That's really good. We're recording this and the UK is still in lockdown. And even if it's lifted by the time our listeners are listening, um, I'm guessing that life's going to take some time to get back to how it was before. And here at Garden Organic, I don't know about you, Chris, but I've realised that gardening during lockdown has kind of divided the nation. There are those that have no time to garden. They're just juggling work, kids and food shopping. And those like me who have lots of time because, well, with no pub, social life or travel opportunities, there's actually nothing else to do. Do you agree? Yes, I do. There was an interesting stat actually on the news saying that um, gardening activity is up by 30%, which is good for gardening, good for us all. And I think a lot of families maybe are taken to gardening. Obviously, if you're, you know, the people, the heroes at the moment, if you're a nurse or a doctor, you're, you're working all the hours God sends or any kind of key worker. Um, but I think there's definitely been an upsurge in gardening due to the fact that people are going, well, we need to have more productive activities than just sitting around in the house. But I think I also want to address those that are, frankly, incredibly busy at the moment. They're yeah. juggling the work. They're trying to educate their kids. They're trying to put food on the table and shopping is difficult and whatever. And therefore, probably their garden is something they want to do, but it's getting neglected because it's just another thing on top of everything else. Well, Chris, we're joined by Emma, who's head gardener mm-hmm. at Garden Organic. Hi. I know that you're now at home and looking after two children, trying to do admin work, shop and look after the family. What words of gardening advice would you give to others, Em, in a similar situation? I think really the main thing is try not to worry that nature is always going to find a way if things are overgrown think about actually that this will be more beneficial for wildlife that you'll find plants coming up that perhaps you'd forgotten before and i would prioritize the task so if you know something needs watering and you've got five minutes water it if you see you know a patch of weed and you can hoe get the hoe out But otherwise, try not to worry too much about it. Just do what you can, when you can. I like the idea that you're talking about a more relaxed approach to your garden, which allows the wildlife within the garden, the birds, the butterflies, the insects, the soil life to actually bloom, to be undisturbed. Yeah, I think sometimes we do have a tendency to overmanage, especially if, like me, you're a bit of a neat gardener. Sometimes I find I'm cutting things down because I think, oh, that looks messy, whereas really it is beneficial for insects and you want to get the right balance. Look at your garden 
done from perhaps a different perspective than you've seen it before and and actually things will survive with you chris you were ill for a couple of weeks which meant again you weren't able to get to your allotment for some time how did that neglect impact what was growing there what was it like when you got back to it i've got a lot of horsetail appearing which i knew would be the case obviously i hadn't sown anything of the more tender crops like the lettuces and the, the stuff that needs a more intense watering i put all my onions in all my potatoes that that kind of crop and they seem to be doing okay to be honest with you um so it's just a matter of getting on top of the weeding again but I, what i do have is a real glut of seedlings because i've been at home and i'm surrounded by propagators i've been sowing seeds galore so yesterday i I did take lot, most of them down to the allotment, put them in a polytunnel, and now I've got a, a, a massive um, amount of pricking out to do. Emma, when lockdown was first announced back in March, you had to literally down tools and leave the gardens at our headquarters at Wrighton at very short notice. I know you've been back a couple of times since. Tell us what survived and what hasn't. In other words, what have you learned about a neglected growing space? So myself and my gardener martin basically tried to put as much stuff in that we thought would survive before we left so we had lettuce some carrot potatoes onions and garlic we didn't expect the carrots to survive however when i went back this week they were emerging that's really interesting that implies then that that some plants are a lot tougher than we give them credit for sometimes it is luck of the draw we put in a lot of new hedging before we left and i've been in I think now twice I've managed to go back in and water but then they're managing I think if you've if you've done good preparation and things have been in your garden a while they will survive I think that's very true Chris wouldn't you agree a lot of it is the preparation it's getting the soil good and ready yeah certainly it really you know it really is I think obviously in the in the winter well the end of the winter I put down quite a heavy organic matter onto those beds so the soil despite being dry you want to make sure it maximizes um, moisture retention basically and that really really helps keeping that soil nice and healthy and actually i put the rake over a few beds yesterday and ready to uh sow my lines of lettuce, lettuce and spinach and it raked out and tilth really easily it's interesting hearing you talk because i'm one of the people who actually now has almost too much time to garden i'm doing much more gardening than usual i can't leave the house and i no longer have a long commute or a social life on top of my working life So I've got more time than I've ever had in the garden. In fact, it's the garden which keeps me steady in these difficult times. But what I find I'm doing is I'm doing jobs I would normally dismiss as being too labour intensive. You know, things like washing down the greenhouse glass and sorting out the dusty corners in my potting shed. These are sort of jobs I'd never get round to otherwise. But I also think, Em, you were saying there's a danger in having too much time being over attentive. And I'm absolutely convinced I am. I've got a tendency now to be watering too frequently. Frequently, my baby plants are completely pampered and their props not tough enough you know if you over pamper them at this stage they won't do as well because they will expect exactly the same level of attention and you may not then be able to give them that that same level you know of watering and feeding so try not to be over intensive yeah but you're right though in saying you know get those jobs done that you wouldn't have normally been able to do cleaning the glass house really it's essential it should be done because you don't want to be harboring pests and diseases and so if you've now got the time and the weather's good yes do it it's the best thing to do really don't keep pampering your seedlings do some of the stuff that you know turn your compost yeah you don't have to do it all in one day in a rush you know make a start and just go slowly i think also having the time to slow down as well it, you know yesterday i was watching a bee collecting pollen and then i found myself studying a line of ants wondering where they were going you know it, it suddenly i realized i have slowed down i am giving myself more time outside in nature and being part of it and that That is so valuable. Thank you both. That's been really helpful and useful. I wish you both well. Em, you're off now to look after your kids, I know, and do that home educating. Good luck with that. Thank you. (laughs) And Chris, you and I have a chance to be talking about the other jobs that need doing this month. Yep. Glad you're better, Chris. Thank you, Emma. I'll see you soon. All right. Take care.
Okay, so Chris, let's just have a quick recap on the monthly jobs, the things that we know we're going to be facing in May. Whether you've got time or not, these are some of the jobs that really it would be good to keep on top of. I think weeding is top of the list, don't you? Uh, it could be. I've not obviously been on the allotment for a while and I've been down there and you can see this uh, emergence, this green sort of film that's covering the allotment. Or the arrival of horsetail again, which seems to be my nemesis. What will you be doing with the horsetail, Chris? They don't like being distracted disturbed it's ironic really that i've had a couple of areas that i've covered for quite a long time and i've uncovered and i've thought oh it looks like it's gone and actually horsetail's coming through so it sits very deep in the soil but what it doesn't like is being disturbed so i will literally just hoe its head off and then i won't put any roots but any green foliage i will put into my compost bin and i just have to do that that's the, that's that's the fight i'll be in all summer with it to be honest with you yeah and the important thing as you say is not to let those roots get on the compost heap yes otherwise you're just going to spread it i also i've got a lot of sort of chickweed fast growing fast turnover annuals and again I just hoe them and let, leave them up to the sun really they're quite small you hoe them they dry out very quickly you just need to get at them before they set seed like a chickweed will germinate grow uh, flower and seed in just three weeks that's a very fast turnover so you need to be getting in there hoeing that out before you've got it everywhere basically make life a bit easier on yourself I think quite a good rule of thumb is to put the foliage of weeds on your compost heap and then the roots big roots of things like docks and dandelions and bindweed and whatever don't for goodness sake put those on the compost heap but maybe think about drowning them put them in a bucket of water for a number of weeks and then that will eventually kill them but you also might get some sort of nutrient value from those roots into the water which you can then use to water your plants yeah, there's a few old boys on my allotment site that make the sort of a perennial weed uh, root tea that's for sure and uh, they, they, they don't mind using it. it's not going to do any harm is it yeah yeah. And watering, yes, I think most of the country had a really particularly dry April. And if May is the same, how would you recommend watering wisely? Well, I think that the timing of it, when you do it, is absolutely essential. So you want to be doing it early in the morning, really, so that it's not transpiring. You're not losing it. And I think also, none of this standing there with a hose pipe malarkey. I've never been a believer in that. Obviously, if you've got millions of plants, you might need to do that. But Otherwise, no, you need to be watering your plants to the base because basically then you can check check your soil, check the health of the plant. Do they need picking over? Can you take cuttings off them? There's all these other jobs you can take in while you're in the process of watering. You want those plants to get their roots down to make them stronger for the summer ahead. And I kind of find, find watering is my bonding session really with my plants. I like the way you say water deep and get it right down into the soil. Don't spray it around the foliage. And I think a good long drink is better than lots of little short ones. I think another tip, which is to keep the dampness in the soil, is to mulch it. Now, I know that's a word that we use often, but mulching is really putting down some sort of covering onto the soil to protect it, to protect the moisture within it. And you can actually use lawn cuttings, for instance, if you press them down around the stem of the plant after you've watered, and that will actually keep the soil moist. It will stop the sun coming down and baking it. Yeah, any, any kind of organic mulch, I mean, it does multiple jobs, doesn't it? It will help retain moisture uh, as it rots the weeds are easy to pull out because they can't get such a grip on it you get nutrient feed off it you might even get a late frost in mate it'll help protect from that and I just think mulch adds a bit of order to the border as well. It might kind of smart and stuff up. So, yeah, definitely a good thing to do. Um, em and I were talking earlier about doing jobs that when you've got the time to do them, they're jobs that are worth doing. And I think one of the most important jobs is setting up as many receptacles as you can to capture water, whether it's a water butt coming off a drain pipe from your potting shed or whether it's buckets or, or whatever just make sure you can capture as much rainwater as possible yeah it's good gotta rain first though we're gonna need that rain <laughs> <laughs> be careful what you wish for plants prefer rainwater really really they really do okay chris so we're now into the sowing season sowing outside the soil should be warm enough by now would you agree oh it certainly is yep it certainly is i mean um, i'm gonna really go for it this week to be honest with you sarah there's gonna be a lot of stuff sown in the ground this week and um, we've got a very good web page which gives you tips on either sowing indoors if you're still sowing indoors 
or sewing outside, following the advice that you've always given, Chris, which is making sure that you, you make the soil very fine, very fine tilth. You make a little line, which is known as a drill, and you sow your seed within that line. And the secret behind that is that when your seeds come up, you will be able to distinguish them from all those other weeds that are also going to come up. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, I will put in some wildflower down and let a few weeds go uh, along the side. I'll have a little green corridor. I'll put some hardy annuals in there because I want those pollinators and I want that wildlife. Yeah, mixing your flowers and your veg. It's a really nice thing to do. And also we'll be potting on and planting. Now, all your little seedlings that have been growing on your balcony or in your windowsill, they need potting on, putting into slightly larger pots before they get planted out. We talked about this last month, so have a listen to last month's podcast or remind yourself from our website pages on the Garden Organic website. And there's even a little YouTube video of how to be planting out that you've grown from seed. Chris, I'm also going to be netting fruit. Um, I've got some lovely strawberries coming on. They're in blossom at the moment and they're about to set fruit. But I'm really determined not to share them, I'm afraid, with the birds. <laughs> yeah, I've put about 70 strawberries on the allotment before uh, for the lockdown before I get ill. And um, they're all doing really well, actually. They're doing quite well. And like yours, they're all in flower. So I will be putting a net over them to protect them I, I too there's nothing like a fresh strawberry so I mean I don't mind sharing one or two but I want the majority the secret I think when you are netting is to make sure it's firmly fixed not just because of wind obviously but also because if you don't fix it firmly around the base birds can get in they can get trapped they can get distressed yeah. it's a horrible sight for everyone so make sure that you firmly fix that netting at ground level as well as up above well I like to actually dig it in and, uh, and then wait it and I'm guessing that the first drop of rain is going to bring out slugs and snails. Now, we don't talk about them much, do we, Chris? <laughs> yeah, they are a common uh, thread going through the world of the gardener, aren't they? <laughs> but I think you're right. And uh, I'm sure every slug and snail is poised for action. <laughs> <laughs> So have a check of the Garden Organic web pages because there you'll learn about barriers, trap, how to plant out strong plants which can withstand the munching of the snail, all sorts of ideas and tips on how to avoid slug and snail damage. And I think later on when we open the post bag with Anton, we'll be talking about slug pellets in particular. Anything else you want to share, Chris? I was just going to say there about the slugs and snails as I've just put out quite a lot of courgette. When they're young, they tend to like them. So I've put a lot of water bottles which I've cut the bottom off over the top of the maximum as a cloche and that's quite a really good way to recycle these bottles which seem to be everywhere so a plastic bottle cut off the bottom put them over your small plant and as they start to put on growth you'll be able to remove that and that should help with the slugs and snails yeah that's a very good tip and I do think the most important thing is just keep checking regularly whatever you use to prevent slugs and snails whether it's eggshells or whether it's upturned grapefruit or beer traps or whatever Keep checking them, and especially if the weather is damp and after rain, because that's what brings the mollusks out. Yep, certainly. OK, Chris, lovely to talk to you. Um, Stay well, won't you? Since Chris and I recorded that chat, it actually hasn't stopped raining. So, yes, it's good for the plants, but we'll both be on top of the weeding. We've got not one, but two interviews this month, and I know you're going to love them both. First, we hear from Charles Dowding, the king of No Dig. Charles is a huge advocate of this technique and I had the pleasure of visiting him at his plot down in Somerset, way back in February. For those of you interested in the no-dig technique, listen on. Charles is a thoughtful and excellent communicator. Following that, I then met Steph Hafferty, who teaches no-dig growing with Charles, and together they wrote a very practical book which has won all sorts of awards, The No-Dig Organic Home and Garden. Morning, Charles. Morning, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me. Um, for the listener who really doesn't know what no dig technique is, can you just explain simply? Yeah, it's about not disturbing the soil at all and allowing all the life organisms in the soil to do their work without interruption or damage and about feeding them. OK, let's go right back. Why would someone dig the soil in the first place? Uh, because they've been led to believe, they mistakenly believe that they're improving soil structure by introducing air and allowing water to drain and also by incorporating organic matter like compost into the rooting zone. I'm paraphrasing there. I don't believe yes. any of that. Yes. <laughs> but no. that's as I understand it, what, why people feel they have to or need to dig. 
but using the no dig technique, you can do exactly the same, but without digging. Tell tell the well, listener how. Well, I wouldn't even put it quite like that. I wouldn't say exactly the same. You're doing it better because soil organisms can build a much better structure than we can create with a fork or spade, which makes what I would call a mechanical tilth as opposed to a stable, firm structure. And actually, that leads to one of the fascinating bits about no dig, which is that you can walk on your beds. So I'm probably shocking some listeners right from the beginning here. Well, you are, because we're all taught not to, because it compacts the soil. Exactly. Um, Well, it only does that if you've previously damaged the structure by digging. It's about looking at the things in a really different way in the end. But having said that, the essence of no dig is, is so simple. It's about just leaving the soil undisturbed and allowing soil life to flourish. And the feeding mechanism that you use, the organic matter mulch that you use, and will depend on your situation, what's available to you. I found for best vegetable growth, compost works really well. And of course, the organic way anyway is to feed the soil and not the plant. Exactly. It's a great way of thinking about things and this also leads to further simplifications that so much of what i'm developing as a method is is about saving time and doing it more simply and being able just to simply understand what what you're doing so feed the soil great and, and it means i put compost on all my beds every year whatever i'm going to grow i'm not thinking in terms of heavy feeders or light feeders as we have previously been taught to to believe and that that leads then into I'm not doing a four-year rotation. You know, one thing leads on to another. We'll come on to those technical points in a minute. But yes, that's very interesting. So again, back to square one. What are you feeding the soil with? Well, I use compost now pretty well exclusively. And your compost is homemade compost. I prefer to use that because I find it has a better life profile, if you like. Loads of microbes in the homemade compost. I do buy some, particularly in the startup phase, when I want to make the soil really fertile from the beginning. I kind of look on it as a a long-term investment in compost. I'll put more on in year one. Okay, so we're talking about soil and feeding the soil. And of course, there's many different types of soil. I assume that the no-dig technique works whether you have clay, sandy soil or whatever. Yeah, in fact, I've had experience of quite a range of soils. I started out on Cotswold brush, very stony soil. And I then moved to France and farmed out there for a while and had a really horrible white sticky clay that... It was the main reason we were able to buy our farm, in fact, because none of the local farmers wanted it. And um, yeah, no, it worked really well on that again. And I I see no reason why it doesn't work on any soil. And clay, you know, it's unfortunate that it's still said in some quarters that you have to dig it first. You absolutely don't. You know, most soil has already got a structure. And particularly if it's growing lots of weeds, that's a really good sign. (laughs) Yes, yes. And also you're helping with that whole water holding of clay, aren't you? Yes. Stopping it getting waterlogged. And the same with the fine sandy soil. You're helping build it up so it can hold water. Yeah, and I think everything is held in place better. So you're getting more value out of the organic matter that you put on. You know, not incorporated is actually better. Let the soil organisms do that and they build it in a more stable enduring form into the soil okay and what about farmyard manure because i think you have used that before. yeah totally i mean uh, in previous times i bought farmyard manure well rotted horse or cow um i'm not too fussy really it's all good stuff um and also then the green waste compost and mushroom compost if you've got leaf mold that counts as compost you know when i use the word compost it's anything decomposed right that, that soil life can get hold of within exactly. the soil and convert to nutrients exactly that's an interesting point that you make there because you know how much is understood or commonly understood about how plants feed and we've been led i would say by the fertilizer industry to think in terms of soluble nutrients you know like the plant roots are there like a mouth you know there comes the nitrogen gulp and it goes in and it's much more complicated than that from what i've read and what i observe you know the conclusions is it's soil life eating organic matter and then excreting it like worm cast is the most visible sign of that and that's where all the goodness is. And it's not so much about soluble nutrients as somehow um, something that the plants can eat through interactions via fungi, yes. you know, the fungal networks that we now hear a lot about and previously were never discussed. Yes. You know, and they're obviously damaged by any kind of soil cultivation. And most of that life is in the top part of the soil, isn't it? The top Absolutely. six inches, 25 yeah. centimetres or whatever. Yeah. So, so if, if you... you're going to put a spade through it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would say even a broad fork. You know, people class no dig as they include broad fork as no dig. And I would say no, you know, I wouldn't actually because you are damaging. I've got a, stra- a trial over there where I'm doing three strips side by side and one is no dig and one is forked. And the fork 
strip yields about 5% less over five years so far. So that's just an example. Okay, so again, let's go back to somebody who is first starting out thinking, I want to do no dig. I have a small garden. I won't be able to access a lot of compost initially. Mm -hmm. How do they get started, Charles? Well, (laughs) one thing we need to mention is weeds at this point, because probably you're starting with weeds. So that's where I advocate laying cardboard. This is just as a one-off Um lay cardboard on your weeds and compost on top and if you could get a minimum of say 10 centimeter four inches compost on the cardboard you could tread it down because the compost wants to be firm and sow and plant into that the day you make it if you want you haven't got to wait for any of the weeds to die underneath or for the cardboard to decompose because it will decompose <clears throat> by the time your plant roots get down there so i would advocate you i mean you say you know someone who hasn't got access to a lot of compost just buy some it'll be the best investment so this is the stuff that you buy in a garden center in a plastic bag well yeah that's <laughs> that's the um the smallest way of buying i suppose and if you've got a, a garden where you need to carry stuff in then yeah you'll have to buy it in a sack i'm afraid and if i you... assume it would be peat free <laughs> oh yeah absolutely um well there's absolutely no need for peat in any form or fashion so it, it could be multi-purpose compost um, mushroom compost whatever where i think it's most interesting to use and i've done it myself is when you have a patch of grass and you think mm-hmm. i'd like to convert that grass mm-hmm. into growing vegetables mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. seems to work very well it definitely does. I'm now getting fantastic feedback now, particularly through social media, and people saying, you know, the wonderful results they've been getting using this approach and marvelling at how simple it is. And you don't need a large area, do you? Exactly. I know I'm, we're surrounded here by yeah. your beautiful home home acres and all yeah. the beds and trials that you're doing, but actually you can do it on quite a small space. Yeah, I mean, this is a quarter acre here of cropped ground, and I'm selling over £20,000 worth of vegetables every year from it, to give yes. you an idea. Yes. Whereas over there, for example, I've got... A, a one trial bed it's about two meters by 1.2 uh, so four feet by seven feet and on that I grow a range of vegetables an amazing amount of food just on that one bed yes. and uh, five years ago we just put a wooden frame on the ground on the grass filled it with compost about two-thirds of a ton that was of compost but since then we've hardly needed any because we firmed it we actually walked on it it was trod the compost down really firm that's not the same as compact you know, firm firm is good and then um that meant there was a lot in there and it, it just holds its shape basically and all i do is put on about less than an inch a year just to keep the level topped up i want to keep it brimful and that that's a way of just maintaining um, soil life in good form and we just keep cropping you know if you're starting right at the beginning like that, mm. you probably don't have a compost heap. But mm-hmm. as you grow and as yeah. you pull your vegetables, you will yeah. almost inevitably have some wastage, won't you, of, of the leaves or the stems or whatever. Throw them on the compost heap. Yeah, absolutely. Everything, including weeds. Within well, a year, you will be self-sufficient, possibly, in compost. Well, not from just one bed, but yeah, from the rest of your garden, hopefully. It depends what you've got. Some people, if you haven't got a big space and maybe you've got all you've got in your garden is a bit of gravel in one bed, or you know, then you won't make a large amount of compost. But if you get in the habit of scrounging, now there's a lot of raw materials out there. Um, paper's really good to compost, for example. Yes. And um, leaves, um, um, neighbours' rubbish if they don't yes, want. Or, yeah. or even ripped up bits of cardboard. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. Well, composting, as our listeners will know, is dealt with in depth in the Garden Organic website. So it's good. worth going and having a look there. We also on the website talk about how to clear an allotment space if you've taken over an allotment and it's covered in weeds. And I think it goes absolutely in line with what you're saying. A lot of people say, can't I use an old carpet? Wouldn't that be the same? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, as long as it is a really old carpet that was made before the age of plastic. I have done that myself. Someone gave me a 1945 Axminster wool carpet. Yes. And beautifully, that worked really beautifully. Because that was a natural fibre, wasn't it? Nowadays carpets are not only not natural but also probably have sorts of chemicals in yeah, them they're the retardants yeah things. exactly so and just don't, really don't want that. i really recommend not to go there no. but there is a lot of brown cardboard now i'm not saying for one minute that cardboard is a perfect product in terms of well, i don't it does know blow away if you're not careful <laughs> yeah, well, i'm also thinking of like the glues that are in there and things and i don't really know it's a very hard thing to find out on the internet exactly what goes into making cardboard but i'm only recommending that you you need to use it once it's not like every year okay so charles let's get a little bit more technical we've learned the basics but as you alluded to there is a fascinating soil life that's doing the work for you that's releasing the nutrients to Mm. the plant roots Mm -hmm. perhaps you can explain that to our listeners this wonderful microbial life that's happening in the soil 
Yeah, well, I first of all, just say that if anyone wants to find it at this in depth, go to the website of Elaine Ingham and her work on what she calls the soil food web. And what I understand is what I've gleaned from her and interpreting that in the light of what I see happening in my garden. The, the, for me, the fungi are one of the key things, the fungal networks. And back in the 80s, it was thought the vegetables didn't use fungal networks to grow. It was only considered to be trees and bushes. But now it's realised that actually most plants do. And it seems to be that the fungi are in the soil. They've got a thread of web of, of their the mycelial threads. And they team up with plant roots because fungi can't feed on their own. They need to get food from what are called root exudates. And that comes from photosynthesis. So you've got that vital interlinkage going on all the time that collaboration between roots and fungal networks because the roots can team up literally physically join in some way the fungal network and communicate that they need certain foods and certain moisture as well and so the fungal threads can already got a network so the way i understand it is new roots of a plant that you've transplanted or sown and got growing just need to tap into it and that um, i think is why no dig works so well okay so the fungal network when when you say fungi it's very tempting to think of little mushrooms underground but it's much <laughs> finer they're much filaments aren't they yeah like cobwebs and but, the filaments are yeah. feeding off the starches the carbohydrates from the roots isn't that right but in mm -hmm. return they're providing the liquid the moisture the nutrients it's an exchange know, isn't it between the, and, and the i think also the these roots. um this feeding has happened with com more complex compounds it's not like pure even pure nitrates maybe you know it might be bound up in all sorts of things and i think that's probably where you're getting better nutrition because the roots have access to to you know the whole range of elements basically it's all there waiting but the beauty of it is is that the nutrients are not in soluble form so they're not being leached out or washed away by rain like here i put my compost on in november december mainly because that's when we're taking final harvest and that is preserving all that fungal network there but the nutrients in the compost it's not like they're washed out by rain that's um, very interesting because that's a very common perception yeah, again that's why i mention it exactly because <laughs> I, I just don't agree with a lot of it it's, it's you know i would say some of this comes from the fertilizer industry to be honest the nutrients from that compost were leaching out there's no way my growth would be so good but I'm, i can do two crops a year yes preserved yes. and i don't think any of the studies on leaching or at least i'm not aware of any that have been done with no dig or no till i mean i i feel that's where science can deal us a bad hand sometimes because it it's not always made clear what all the parameters you know it sounds and it sounds scientific <laughs> they've got all these measurements but. but it's also science as you say that's led by industry yeah and that's what organic finds over and over again because right. it, it's big money behind industry yeah. and science is only as good as the questions it asks totally that's so true and we're little money i, I feel in the organic world that we've been too much backed into a corner by science and I've noticed that organic growers, particularly market gardens, God, do they talk about nutrients a lot and, you know, NPK and all this kind of thing. They sound like a fertilizer packet sometimes. And that is not right, because like I was saying back in the 80s, the Soil Association was not talking a lot about soil to be. Maybe they feel the need to speak the language so that they well, get heard rather than appearing as cranks. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly it. But the result of that is that you, you need to keep always in mind that, that it makes you, you're, you're talking their language all the time. And that means you can't open up these new horizons, which is so interesting and so valid, I would say. And, and a classic example of that is the use of words. You know, the way that chemical farmers using synthetic fertilizers and poison sprays have allowed to appropriate the word conventional. Yes, I agree entirely. Oh, well, I'm so pleased to hear that. But you see, I hear all the organic farmers and growers using that word conventional farms do this. Yeah. No, they're not conventional. Organic is the conventional. Yeah. The other is agrochemical. Exactly. And that's how I always refer to them. Brilliant. Let's keep it that one. <laughs> no. I read an interesting sentence in your book, and I have to say your book is fantastic, No Dig Organic Home and Garden, oh, which you, you wrote with Stephanie Hafferty. In mm -hmm. fact, I'm meeting Steph later to talk a lot about the book. Um, but you wrote the sentence, in your comparison beds, total yields were similar initially, but actually the quality was intriguingly different mm -hmm. of the produce from the No Dig bed. Okay. Can you expand on that? Yeah, such a difficult word though, isn't it? Quality. Yes. I mean, yes. What's quality to one person is not to another. <laughs> I'm guessing perhaps taste or texture? Yeah, it, it was actually more um, texture and appearance. Like the leaves, are, I find them, look more glossy and lush and, and rich and abundant. And on the Dig bed, they're more matte. Flavour, we don't really notice much difference. We we tried these tests and um, once actually the potatoes did taste better on the dig bed, I must acknowledge. And another time the carrots tasted better on the no dig bed. So it's like, it's a hard one to be precise about that. But the, the, the standout difference is the yield, which interestingly, uh, in the first six years, it wasn't hugely different. It was always a little bit more on the no dig bed. But in year seven and year eight, the no dig bed has been 15% ahead. 
yes. of the dick bed which has fallen away with it. So just to recap, mm. it's not so much the fact that you're putting added nutrients into the soil. It's more about building up that soil life so that the nutrients can travel to the plant roots. Yeah, that's a good summary. And you put on your compost throughout the year or just only in the autumn or only in the spring? Yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, I, m- my aim is always to keep it simple. I find it quickest, easiest to put it on once in the autumn, late autumn, just because that's when we're clearing. And then that's for the whole year. So I'm not putting on any more in the summer, even when we're doing second plantings, because it's summer, you just haven't got time really to do that kind of thing. So summer is all about sowing, planting, picking, not much weeding. And then we twist out plants to clear the bed. I like the way you say you twist out plants, presumably Mm. because the soil is such good structure. You don't need to dig out a leak. Well, no, exactly. And I'm always looking, thinking, you know, leave as many roots in as possible because that's food for microbes. Yes. And so also twisting disturbs the soil less. So that rotation, it snaps off the main roots and leaves most of the fine roots in the ground. Have you suffered from any persistent diseases or have you had experience of the glass, the ghastly club root? Or in my case, I had the allium leaf miner last autumn. In my previous garden, I had some allium uh, white rot. And, yes. And that's a very persistent soil fungus. <laughs> it's one of the few bad fungi, most fungi are good. Yeah. And I found four years um, was enough. I, I was able to grow leeks and onions in that bed without it reappearing. And I think no dig helps because... Just in a very practical terms, if you've got um, a soil problem like that, or say club root, and you, you're digging it, and then it, bits of it are on your fork, you know, you're spreading it around. Yes. So at least with no dig, it's keeping it contained, and you know exactly where it is. <laughs> Charles, you're an organic grower, of course you are, and I can see you're surrounded by wonderful Somerset countryside. I would have thought, therefore, that wildlife is important to you. Yeah, well, it's very interesting word, wildlife, because I would say in the organic world, one of the most important bits of wildlife is what's in the soil and that links to what we've been saying so no dig for me is the starting point if you want to encourage wildlife you you need the wildlife in your soil bringing flowers in helps you've got a broader mixture of plants dotted around the garden you're going to get a a better balance of of different pest and predator if you like all through your space depending how big it is and organic gardening you first started as an organic gardener or how did that come into your life yeah i was passionate about that when I began because I read this book when I was at university about animal rights by Australian professor called Peter Stringer he got me interested in nutrition and actually I became vegetarian in 1980 it was a little bit tricky in those days there wasn't much catering for vegetarians yes I was the same um, but anyway that we led me on to cranks and we ate at cranks well yeah because we were cranks <laughs> that's quite right yeah and I was eating like a rabbit as my father kept saying so what I got then got interested in was nutrition and, and reading that led me to organic and and I grew up on a farm using chemicals and I started to question that and not only the chemical contamination of food but also whether the, the nutritional quality was in there uh, particularly from using fertilizers that's a it hasn't been really addressed enough I don't think you know they're, they're weakening the nutrient profile and so um, yeah I joined the Soil Association in 1980 and interestingly in that time I was no dig from the beginning but I wasn't really talking about it the soil wasn't on the map as a subject in, even for the Soil Association in the 1980s Charles I know you're a busy man because of all your growing and I can see that that's testament round here but you also lecture you hold courses to spread the word about no dig techniques what do you do when you're not growing when you're <laughs> not doing all this work Oh uh, well, How increasingly little. Actually. <laughs> How does he relax? Um, <clears throat> I'm a bell ringer. Actually, I do campanology. Oh yes, ringing the church bells here in the village in the neighbouring town of Bruton. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've got six heavy bells, which I really enjoy because it's a good weight to pull. You can really get into it. My other hobby is is not. It's related to growing. It's weather. I'm just fascinated by weather. Always have been. I've got weather records going back 50 years nearly. You know, that just ties in so much. I'm always keeping an eye on the weather and what happens next. And that links also to this fascination with climate now. What would you say is the biggest challenge that you faced with no dig? Um, Persuading or getting people to understand it. (laughs) (laughs) And the simplicity of it as well. I mean, I think for... List some listeners. The big one will be getting hold of enough compost, and that and that's what I'm very keen to address by saying scale down, grow smaller, use whatever amount you've got in a smaller area because you'll get more value from it. That way, you'll save time, and you will be surprised how much you can grow. Thank you, Charles. Thank you very much for your time. I'm about to go and meet Steph, your partner in writing, to talk about the No Dig Organic Home and Garden, which is a wonderfully practical book. Thank you.
Steph, it's such a delight to meet you. I've read your books. It's interesting to talk to somebody who not only knows how to grow organically, but knows what to do with it when they've harvested it. Absolutely, yes. Um, when our publishers approached us with the idea, they very much wanted that aspect of not only producing as much food as possible in whatever space you have, but also then what happens next. And so uh, we wrote it so that it would cover not only growing things and harvesting them, and also um, from my perspective, I like to see how much, how many things I can make out of each plant that I grow. That's what struck me about the book, because it's not just a book about vegetable soup recipes. There's so much more in it. It's how to store the vegetables, how to preserve them. You even have tips on how to turn them into household cleaners and such. Exactly. So something like parsley, it obviously has all the culinary uses. You can dry it very easily to store it. You can chop it up and freeze it as well. It makes a fantastic cleaner for the bathroom and kitchen. Just parsley on parsley itself? And vinegar mm -hmm. you infuse the vinegar with the parsley and in the book we show you how to make cleaners for free almost if you've got the vinegar and um, you can use the seeds the flowers attract different pollinators so it's looking at a plant in many different perspectives yes it's got the holistic view towards it, it. exactly it's not just something you put on the edge of your plate as a garnish <laughs> But the joy of this book, the Grow, Cook, Use and Store Your Harvest, mm. and your other one, The Creative Kitchen, you talk not just about cooking with plants, but also all the other things you can do with them. There's even some um, cosmetics with, made with herbs and oils and things. Mm. It's fascinating. Thank you. And you must have enjoyed writing it because it's certainly very inspiring to read. Thank you. Yeah, it is. It's great. It's great from writing it. And also it fits in very much, I think, with people's desires to reduce plastic. Yes. Because you're, you're using fewer products. That my interest in making these things comes from being um, quite allergic to artificial fragrances in the respect that I'll come out with um, a horrible rash or I'll sneeze or I'll get a blinding headache. I was learning from in my 20s onwards various things I could use that didn't make me feel poorly and it's just such a lark and also you can really make lovely scented things and it almost makes cleaning nice. Well I must <laughs> say I was very impressed by your fizzing toilet. Oh yeah they're a joy. Cleansers. I mean yes. I've heard of bath bombs I've not heard of toilet bombs before. It's like a bath bomb but you make them in an um, ice cube tray. So you've got that size, little, little, squares, little yes. squares, and almost the same ingredients as a bath bomb. But the herbs are different, so you'll put things in which are very good for cleaning, such as rosemary or thyme or lemon um, balm. And then you pop those in, and they will fizz on their own. But if you want true fizzing joy, <laughs> long evenings fly by here, um, <laughs> pop some vinegar in and the whole thing goes fizz, fizz, fizz. It's lovely. It's, it's fantastic. It's good fun. And you can keep them in a jar in the bathroom and it looks very country leather. You know, it's all charming. Well, you heard it here, listener, how to have fizzing joy in your yeah. toilet. <laughs> but also, it, it's so practical. That's what yeah. I like about because it. It's good. It's nice not to have the waste because if you're making something that's using a lot of lemon juice, these are the things you can do with all yes. the the rinds. Yes. So you can make a very simple cleaner just by putting them in a jar, filling it up with vinegar, leaving it for two weeks, straining it, smells amazing, will clean everything. And if you've got just the peel, not the pit, and dry that and then whiz it up in a food processor, that is a really good base for skin scrubs. Citrus is really good for your skin. Mm. You can use it in your toilet bombs. Back to the toilet bombs. And you can also add it to cooking because it's assuming you're using organic citrus, because otherwise you've got the horrible waxes and things on the surface. And also I then thought, well, Im let's imagine a situation where you haven't got any citrus, but you want it for a recipe. So another thing that interested me, Steph, was looking at some of your recipes. In fact, I think probably all of them. You've probably grown most of the ingredients. Is that right? Yeah, they're almost entirely recipes for things that you can grow yourself without any fancy equipment. You could use simple cloches rather than a polytunnel, but grow yourself in the UK. And there'll be a few things you can't very easily, olive oil or black pepper, but almost entirely. I think that you can have the pleasure then of an absolute home-cooked meal. But I also made sure that all the quantities for things like pulses or cooked tomatoes, 
are the same as opening a tin. So people coming home from work, you might have a few things from your garden or allotment, but you haven't had time to soak beans or you don't have any home preserved tomatoes that you can actually just open the tins and add those as well. I have to say, when I arrived at Steph's house, I immediately knew it was her house because... Other, the other houses in the row had the inevitable one or two rose bushes and a bit of tired lawn. Steph's has raised beds with vegetables and netting and a little fruit tree. I get the impression every inch of your house and your garden is used to make the most of plant. Yes, as much as possible. I've even got potatoes chitting on the bedroom floor of my son who's at university. <laughs> <laughs> and there's mushroom boxes in there all doing their thing. Um, so your growing area isn't very big behind the house. Then. It's about 30 by 100 feet, which is... The average size the av- of a small pr- back garden. Yeah, this is um, an ex-council house. It- but your theme is very much to keep yourself in plant food throughout the year, isn't that right? Pretty much entirely as much as I possibly can, uh, within reason, obviously. Um, I have lemon trees in my kitchen. <laughs> They're overwintering there, so I try citrus as well. But yes, absolutely. The polytunnel is full of vegetables. I have salad in there, um, leaves that I can cook with so they can either be raw or used in stir fries or in soups or stews. I have brassicas that will produce earlier than the brassicas at the allotment. I can put potatoes in there quite soon because I've got things to protect them with. Um, So that produces food really right up to the hungry gap. Now, the hungry gap, just to listeners, is not when the sun comes home from university. No, (laughs) it feels like it. (laughs) The hungry gap is actually that well-known time round about early spring when you've used up Mm. most of your winter produce, but the spring-summer produce isn't yet ready. Exactly. It's, it depends on your location, but it's kind of end of April, early May time and everything's bolting because it's their flowering time. And the blessing of things going to flower is almost entirely the shoots are edible. Ah. So it's also about looking at your plant and thinking, not just this cabbage, I can now no longer eat it because I didn't eat it and it's gone to flower. You think, oh, great, cut it and you still can use all of that cabbage. I think what you say chimes with me because we're so led by what we see in the supermarket as to what we think we can eat. Exactly. And of course, once you start growing your own, you realise you're much more creative with stems, leaves, flowers, all stages of the plant and the vegetable life. Yes, because, you know, you've grown it, so you really want to make the most of it. That brings me very neatly on to organic. Why is organic important to you? It's a very natural way of growing, and also I think it's a much healthier way of growing, that you're not ingesting all those chemicals. It's also much better for the soil and soil life. It's much better for wildlife. It's For me, it's a no-brainer. And as my elderly neighbours said, back in the day, it was all organic. Mm. You know, it's only relatively short period of time in human history that all this vast use of chemicals has come into play. And we do waste, as a pop, as a species, we waste a lot of food, particularly in the West. So if people were not wasting food... If everything was used in the way that food should be respected, not just thrown into landfill, then the argument, I think, that you can't produce enough food without all these horrible chemical cocktails kind of falls apart. Mm. When did you start growing, Steph? When did gardening come into your life? Um, Actually, used to have cacti and succulents and things like that and I was always interested in being in the garden but and then I got a found a book when I was about 17 in a charity shop which I've still got and it's the Farmer's Weekly Wives Book of Alcohol Recipe. 17, that's I, bingo. I know, that's what I thought. And so I was looking through it and I discovered you can make wine out of various things. You can make them out of marrows. So I grew some courgette plant marrows in my parents' very nice back <laughs> garden in the corner. For making alcohol, I got really into making <laughs> wine, which makes you very popular when you're young. Wine out of it. <laughs> When I went to university, I went with two demijohns of elderberry wine. <laughs> this is the most remarkable introduction to organic growing I've heard. It was basically getting drunk with your friends. Yes. That's what it was, cheaply. I think when I was a very little girl, 
and I had my Playmobil and my Lego and I had a train set as well. A lot of my games were around growing and farming, which I think was influenced by reading stories like Little House on the Prairie, also um, TV, um, The Good Life. Mm. Mm. So it was all in there and I would play those games. And now it's more about food than alcohol, though ah, I do okay. still. That's why there's a bottle of rum on the mantelpiece. It's really I hadn't noticed infusing. it. <laughs> And you and Charles both um, are strong advocates of the no dig technique. Absolutely. How how did you get into no dig? I kind of heard about it. I had my allotment. Then I would hear about this bloke called Charles who lived in the area and did this no dig thing. And living quite near Glastonbury, I thought, oh, well, he's probably just one of those guys that sits there and thinks of other things while smoking interesting substances and just lets things grow. It just sounded really weird. But I was in the local library and I saw the book and I thought, oh, I'll have a look. And I I looked through it and it was spookily at the same time. um, I was looking for some work and a friend of mine mentioned that this guy locally was needing someone to help in the garden. And I applied and I got the job working with Charles. So I was, yeah, so that's how I got properly. It was like an immersion in it. So I worked there for two and a half years. So it was almost like a kind of no-dig university because it was quite a long time. It was a deep immersion. Yeah. Now, talking of time, I'm intrigued because here is someone who clearly spends her days out getting her hands muddy, her boots muddy, growing everything she can, then harvesting it, then cooking it, and yet still finding time to write about it and bringing up a family. It's fascinating, Steph. What is the secret behind this? rum on the mantelpiece I think (laughs) Um, I think it's working out a balance as much as you can I mean I probably don't have what anyone would consider balance I do tend to do pretty much a seven day week I'm very lucky that my work is very flexible each week is different Charles and I do courses together so I look at are we doing those these things are what I put as like the framework for the week and then I work out I look at the weather and see okay Tuesday's going to be horrible weather so that's a really good day for writing Wednesday looks great so Wednesday's the day I'm going to hoe the allotment One thing I do want to ask you Steph is I'm a cook as well Mm -hmm. and I do a lot of creative cooking rather than slavishly following a recipe and I'm really intrigued by recipe writing. Do you have to keep adjusting every time you say you're going to do a soup or a hummus mm-hmm. recipe or whatever? You have to get the measurements exactly right. Is Do you have to cook it a second time because you used half a teaspoon instead of three quarters of a teaspoon? Is it very, very precise writing a recipe? Yes, for a book. Absolutely, because I think you've always got to be aware that not everybody is confident with playing with a recipe. So a lot of people feel much more comfortable having these parameters and you have to check it several times. So for anyone who's listening who's starting out on the organic journey, what would your advice be? They may not have an allotment even. From starting small, what would be your advice? I think if you only had a very small space, I think some of the best things to grow in a really small space are herbs, particularly the herbs that um, fit with the kind of food that you like. I mean, something like growing coriander, which is one of my favourites, if you grow it yourself, you've not only got the leaves, which you can use in your food, and the stems are also edible, but when they go to flower, then if it's a balcony or an outside space, you're attracting the beneficial pollinators. You can also eat those flowers. Then they'll go to a green seed and you cannot buy that in the shops it tastes like lemony coriander it's got a zing and sprinkle that on your salads on hummus it's fantastic it's the pleasure of something you can only eat if you've grown it yourself and then if you've got some that dry you can use those either to grow more coriander or whisk them up in a food process and have your own homemade coriander spice And then remove the coriander from pot and you've got the roots, which are highly prized in Thai cooking. They use them all the time, but to add another flavour dimension. It's one of the sheer pleasures of growing your own, I think, is fresh flavours and also being able to experience things that are a bit different and just explore all the possibilities, really, that vegetables offer. 
One other thing that struck me from your book, Steph, was the very strong message about eating seasonally. In other words, not supermarket shopping, where you can see in January, you can see strawberries and raspberries and uh, tomatoes flown in from Spain or whatever. I think this is something that you feel very strongly about, and it's part of the organic message, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. I think it's it's a very important thing um, that we've lost, as you say, with supermarkets and so much choice all the time. The thing with eating seasonally, actually, is it's a great joy and a great pleasure. It's not something that is spoiling your palate in any way because you then start enjoying and looking forward to flavours. So you can tweak the season a bit. You can cover plants with fleece to bring them on a couple of weeks earlier. You can grow potatoes in pots indoors to get a Christmas crop of new potatoes. That's still eating seasonally because you've grown it. It's just tweaking. You've got the anticipation of the first raspberry. I think it's particularly exciting with fruit because of the sweetness and the colours and you just feel, oh, summer's here. And also your palate is fresh, isn't it? Exactly. It's not jaded by having these things constantly every day. Yeah, and also if you're eating out of season, it's been shipped in from goodness knows where. So it's got the air miles... And with preserving, you can still have the taste of tomatoes in the winter. Mm. If you dehydrate tomatoes and then put them in a food processor, (laughs) one of my things, make it into a powder. Then you've got this amazing tomato powder, which you can add to sauces, spoonfuls of that in the winter time, into soups, into stews. It adds a lovely tomatoey dimension it's a much better flavor than tomatoes bought from the supermarket in december and then you've got that pleasure of that first tomato oh, that yeah. you pick that you've grown exactly it, it is such a joy yeah. it is really good i'm still smiling when i think about steph and her wine and i promise we didn't drink any not a drop In mid-May, we'll be releasing an extended version of Charles's interview in one of our unpruned podcasts. To listen to it, you just have to subscribe to the Organic Gardening Podcast. And if you want to know more about how to follow the no-dig technique, search for it on the Garden Organic website. Or buy their book, The No-Dig Organic Home and Garden, and go make yourself a toilet bomb. Now it's time to open our post bag. As usual, Chris and I are joined by our colleague, Dr. Anton Rosenfeld, and Hannah is back with us to open the emails. Hi, Hannah. Hello, how are you? Very well, thank you. And we've got all four of us online, which is a technological achievement. Should we go straight to question one? Yes, great. So I have a question about pest control. This lady who's written in says, I've been growing in a greenhouse for approximately three years now. And this year is the first year I've encountered an infestation of aphids. They have literally destroyed some of my tomato seedlings and now have moved on to my salvia seedlings. Might you suggest an organic way of getting rid and preventing preventing any future infestation. Anton, can you start us off with this one? Well, the fact that we're getting aphids so early in the season suggests that they may have overwintered in the glass house. And so I think we want to perhaps examine where the source is. They might have come from some perennials that you've left in your glass house over the winter. So it might be worth having a look at those. The thing about a glass house is that really it's a blank canvas for aphids. There's no creatures there which will actually eat the aphids. So aphids multiply exponentially. Each aphid can produce six new ones every day in the spring. So you can see why they quite quickly get out of control. But the fact is that you've now got seedlings which are covered with aphids and you want to be able to deal with them now. There's a number of lines of attack. I would say because the situation has got quite desperate now, we might need to resort to soap sprays. They might not be our ideal solution. Anton, when you say a soap spray, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Really, we want to be going for one that is actually a horticultural spray, which has been prepared as an organic insecticide. So the mode of action that they work is they're actually made from plant oils. And what they do is they remove the waxy coating from the aphids and they dehydrate them. It's all made from natural products. I would recommend this rather than just going for washing up liquid because washing up liquids generally they're a detergent they're often petroleum based they don't degrade and also it's 
quite hard to get that sort of exact right mix so that you're attacking the aphid but you're not actually damaging your plants whereas if you use a proper horticultural soap spray they and this do is something that. you can get from the organic gardening catalog presumably online it is yes you can get it there um in future you really want to look at sort of giving a glass house a good clean over the winter because i think that's probably where the aphids have come from Brilliant. That's really useful. Thank you, Anton. Um, and the ladies also asked whether it's too late to sow again. What would you say? I'd say don't panic. It's not too late to sow again. Um, your tomatoes may be that you won't get a crop until the autumn, but anything else, the salvias and your other small veg or bedding plants, you, you've still got plenty of time. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much. Um, so if we move on to question two, now I think this is probably quite a common question. So this person's written in and said, I've run out of winter veg and my spring plantings aren't ready to eat yet. How can I avoid this gap and have veg all year round? OK, so we're coming up to a period which is commonly known as the hungry gap. And this is a time of year when your winter veg has just started to run out of steam. It's Some of it might be starting to flower and bolt. Some of it's not really very productive anymore. But all your things that you're getting ready, a lot of it's still in seed trays and not really producing any food yet. So what you can do about it now is to try and eke out some of your winter veg just for that little bit longer to cover that gap. Um, quite often, people are sort of obsessed by tidiness. They see that their kale is just starting to bolt and they see the chard is perhaps thinking about bolting as well, and they just dig it up and get rid of it. Well, actually, I think they're missing a bit of a treat there because a lot of these things really do taste quite nice still when they're at that bolting stage. Kale, you can just cut off all the sort of flowering shoots and they taste absolutely delicious. Um, I call it crockily, a cross between um, kale and broccoli. Might catch on one day, but I, I do think you're missing a trick by just sort of getting rid of it straight away. I would second that, Anton. I've been cutting my, my flowering kale stems and they are so delicate and tender that if you steam them and then eat them with butter and salt or olive oil, it's just, it's not unlike asparagus. That's oh. interesting. I think you're right that you have a tendency to think, well, this is my crop for this season and then dig it up and start again. Chris, is this something that you sort of look to manage on your allotment? Yeah, I think the thing is, is remember that not all edible plants are seasonal. You can do perennial planting. Obviously, rhubarb comes to mind. You've been mentioning kale. Um, you can get perennial kales. So you can have plants on your plot that you can graze, if you like, over time and through this hungry period. One little tip for you, actually, is I have a grapevine on my allotment. And the Supreme guys uh, on the allotment, either side of me, they actually use the leaves, the new leaves in the spring from the great one to wrap rice and have with dinner if you steam it a little bit. So there's always little tips and tricks to pick up on a site when you get chatting to people. And there's no reason for you not to be cropping. And is there any, are there any sort of tricks to speeding things up or do you just need to wait and let nature take its course? Well, I would certainly with the, with the spring crops that I've just sown now that are coming through, obviously my lettuces, my spinach, I can, I'm a big believer in seaweed extract. I think it moves the growth on. It's a tonic. It makes for a, quite a tough plant, quite physically tough plant. And I always find that gives a boost that very successfully on my allotment. I always use it as a foliar feed. I, use, I also use it on my balcony. So that would be my, my sort of tip. Other gardeners might have others. Yeah, if you keep on harvesting the leaves and also removing any sort of flowering growth, it just to keep on sort of producing more leaves. But this yeah. also works with chard, doesn't it, Anton? I've noticed that, that if, to stop the chard bolting, if you cut the central stem, you start getting little leaves coming out the side. That's right, yeah. If basically a plant's got two choices it can either think it's going to keep on going or it's going to reproduce and you really we're trying to get it out of that reproductive mode and carry on sort of growing in that vegetative state one other tip that i've got especially if you're growing things in a greenhouse over the winter like perhaps salad crops is if you put them outside in the early spring that will make them less likely to bolt for you so you can certainly get i'd say another month's life out of them by moving them outside thank you so the next question we've got um, is a short question, and I'm imagining it doesn't have a particularly short answer. Are organic slug pellets OK to use? Well, Hannah, you're quite right. I could take quite a long time to answer this question, but let's keep it short. 
In simple terms, the organic slug pellets don't have metaldehyde. That's the terrible poison that the ordinary slug pellet has. Instead, they use ferric phosphate. This kills the slugs by affecting their gut metabolism, which causes them to stop eating and eventually starve. However, these organic slug pellets do have chemicals in them. They're called chelators, which when they get into the soil, they've been proven to affect other soil life, i.e. the friendly earthworm. So they're not perfect. And I feel it very much comes down to a personal decision as to whether you feel able to use them, even though they've been designated for use as an organic grower. If you do use them, I would definitely say use them sparingly. And also, I would definitely suggest that you go to the Slugs and Snails webpage on the Garden Organic website because we have lots of tips and advice there how to combat the mollusks. There are plenty of things you could do with barriers, traps. Anton, you've used wool pellets before now, haven't you? I have, yeah. This is one of a number of sort of barrier techniques. Um, the thing about wool pellets is that they have a sort of substance in there that irritates the slugs and they don't like to crawl over it. I'd say they're moderately successful. I, I found that they protected my winter pansies quite well in pots. There is no one magic silver bullet against slugs, unfortunately. I think it's really just trying all sorts of lots of little things, going out on night patrols, having planting things out a bit later when they're less tasty for slugs. All of those things together, I think, really is, is the way to combat slugs. Is it something you have a problem with on your allotment, Chris, or do you find you're quite well protected? No, I do have a problem with them. I have a lot less problem since I took it. I had sort of paths that the last guy I put in that had tarp over it and stuff, and that was housing them. You've got to be careful you don't leave big, uh, sort of, if you like, residential areas for slugs and snails to breed and to stay safe when it's dry and the weather's dry and doesn't suit them. I would say probably my biggest weapon on the allotment are my tongs, <laughs> my barbecue tongs, because I will go down there after the wet and pick them off personally and then remove them from the site. I hope you give them a good clean. <laughs> The slugs or the tongs? The tongs. <laughs> Mrs. C wouldn't be happy if I didn't do that. <laughs> but I, I tend to then release them into. I'm right next to a sort of new river bit, so I don't. I don't have the heart to destroy them. They all serve a purpose. But yeah, I agree with Anton wholeheartedly. It's about keeping stuff hygienic, clean, maybe bit of tong use, barriers. It's a mixture of things. No one. I like the, the expression. No one silver bullet. Brilliant. Thank you. So our last question is, it's another one we've been asked quite a lot lately, is people are looking to spend a bit more time in their gardens. So how do I start a compost heap? Um, what do I need? How does it work? And when will it be ready? Well, I literally uh, built one yesterday. Um, it's very simple, to be honest with you. I actually use pallets that I, I've um, scrounged here and there. You can use any wood, any t uh, secondhand timber stuff that you use. What you really want to do is make a base. So what I did yesterday is I put three full-size pallets, one at the back, two at the sides, and nailed them together. So I've got like a bay area. Then I cut one in half and I put a lower one at the front. And I kind of like pallets because obviously they're slatted, so the air and the water can get in and that will help the compost break down. I then took some all the weeds I pulled out yesterday, non-perennial, all the sort of tops of weeds that I'd hoed off, and I put them in, I mix them with shredding from my uh, shredder. I, I'm in the office and that's going to kick it going. And I'll just keep adding to that, making sure there's a balance between brown waste, that's like cardboard, paper, shred stuff, and green waste, which is stuff I'm picking off the allotment. Make sure there's a nice balance for that. And then I'll keep turning it and watering it. I like to turn it, I must point out, with my hands these days because I do get slow worms on the allotment. And I don't really want to be putting a fork in there because I might cause some damage. So I tend to turn it in my hands, make sure it's kept moist. And if I'm lucky, maybe in about three months time, I'll have some lovely compost. Brilliant. OK, well, that's really useful. Thank you all. Despite the pops and crackles down the line, I hope you found our advice helpful. Keep your queries coming in. And don't forget, make sure you're subscribed to the Organic Gardening Podcast. We'll be back next month when Chris chats with chef and grower Mark Diacono. We hope you stay safe and well. And if you can't get out, open the window early in the morning and listen to that spring bird song. It may lift you beyond the cruel and difficult times we're in. In the meantime, happy organic growing. Our thanks to Kevin McLeod for providing the music.